Norman Lear was uh, helping us do the people for the American way type of thing. Mm -hmm. It'll just help more people understand more people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sort of background on that. Norman Lear lives Norman just Lear. north of here, Shaftesbury. Yeah. Okay, good morning and welcome to Cab Notes for September 2019. And this morning we're talking about um, time on task and the climate challenge. Now, uh, years ago, I guess when the middle school was here in Main Street, there was a principal named Jurgen Coombs, and I was in the school board at the time, and he kept on talking about time on task, trying to make sure that the students, when they were at school, were doing useful things. And then a few weeks, uh, months ago, I guess, there was an article in the banner where one of the local columnists was saying, well, why don't we just do something about this climate crisis? No, just do something. So then I heard about Bill McKibben's book here, Falter, which focuses on uh, a lot of um, different kind of human experiences now which may impact on, I don't know, <laughs> humanity's future and uh, how the climate crisis can probably better be met in his mind by mainly uh, people getting involved. So we're very fortunate to have some real expert people and mostly you know, excited people about the climate. There's Bill and Barbara and Ethan, and we're certainly very grateful for, for you all coming today. So why don't we just start with uh, each of you telling us why you're interested or how you got interested into the climate um, debate or activity. Ethan, you want to tell us you know, where it came into your life? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I was born in San Diego, California, and my I was raised by a single mother, and with my mom we lived very close to the San Diego Zoo. Um, and I, some of my best memories as a child were going to the zoo almost every day, um, mm -hmm. after school and with my notepad and my hat and my watch and I would just wander around um, and study all the animals and for the longest time for the first 12 years of my life I wanted to be an animal animal behaviorist and I wanted to um, <clears throat> also discover new species because I, I, I started to realize by reading the National Geographic and um, press from the San Diego Zoo that there are new animals species being discovered all the time, um, but at the same time when I was very young I became really aware um, of how many animals were endangered and how many animals were already going extinct. And I, I had this feeling um, in 2010 actually, when I was 12, um, that okay, I have a sense that by the time you're 20, by the time you're 30, you might not be able to be a conservationist in the way that you maybe had thought because there might not be many animals, there might not be many plants. Um, and that's something that I think people people now are even thinking, like scientists are being hyperbolic about um, and exaggerating, but we're losing so many species, millions of species that we share and cohabit this world with. Um, and really for, for me it comes down to um, I've had, I've had inter-species um, relationships in my life with, with different animals. Um, and I think that when people have those, it actually really changes their perspective on, on what nature is and that we're not separate from that because we really aren't. It influences us and we influence it in turn. Um, so my, my tie to the climate um, in the past couple of years and especially this year has really become about um, protecting biodiversity um, and protecting people um, because <laughs> because people I think have a lot of potential um, to not just destroy the environment but also um, uplift it. Mm -hmm. Well that's a fantastic story. Thank you. It's <laughs> a yeah. wonderful story. Yeah. So Barbara you got involved in this. <coughs> yeah I taught um, an environmental policy course for many years at Meredith College, which is an all-women's college in Raleigh, North Carolina. 
and I started teaching in 1990 and having studied environmental policy and then teaching environmental policy I was really aware of this thing called um, uh, climate change and um, it seemed really um, alarming but also really distant that mm -hmm. uh, it was something that way off in the future and um, um, I had an older older daughter Sarah who uh, had a brain tumor and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, was with us for a couple of years and then died from the brain tumor. But mm -hmm. she was absolutely passionate about um, low income housing that was um, energy efficient housing. And so she worked with a company that designed and uh, designed energy efficient housing and then um, taught people how to build energy efficient housing and followed up with a uh, pretty rigorous accountability about um, the building structure. And um, she actually has an energy efficient house named for her in uh, Pittsfield, um, North Carolina. And whenever we go back, we drive by it to see how it's doing. Mm. Um, so, um, when I retired, um, moved to Vermont in order to live with um, my daughter and grandchildren, my son-in-law. And when I retired, I thought, I, I just want to devote myself to this one cause. Um, that, mm. that climate change seemed to me like it was accelerating, and the reports that were coming out were disturbing. And um, so I thought, well, I'll join a 350 group. Mm -hmm. And um, 350 is a nationwide uh, organization that was started by Bill McKibben at Mil Middlebury uh, College with uh, some students. And I thought, I'm in Vermont, I'll, I'll join a 350 group. Well, there was not one. There wasn't one in Bennington, and I found out later there wasn't one anywhere in Vermont, that it was wow. just getting started. <laughs> um, and uh, so I thought, I'll just start one. And um, so I started having um, a book discussion meetings and gradually put together a group of people that were also interested in climate. And um, so now we're going to do this climate strike on next Friday. And I think it's going to prove to be a major event in Bennington. And um, I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> I, well, personally, I think our family, my parents grew up in the Depression, of course. And so frugality was an important aspect of our life. and. Um, <clears throat> since 1976, um, we decided, I'm not sure if I decided or somebody else did, that we would heat with wood instead of oil. No, don't bring the stuff over from the Middle East, but just get the source of heat you need from locally. So I, I think one important thing is to heat with as little bit of um, fossil fuel as possible. And then the second idea was to uh, grow as much of your own food as you can. We just harvested 160 onions the other day and we have all these squash we grew and we picked beans every other day. <clears throat> so by locally sourced food plus shopping at the farmer's market, I think that's helpful. And then the third thing would be basically Brighten the corner where you are. You know, don't travel all over the world. You know, just try to fix things up where you are. Um, so those are kind of three different aspects that uh, you know, seem to me to be important for environmental health. 
You know, you've been involved <coughs> professionally in this for a long time. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just thinking, uh, was going, trying to go back to my roots, thinking of Ethan's story. When I was very young, I didn't want to have a lot of impact on the environment. I mean, this was a long time ago before we had very many words about this, but I just felt like we were, um, I was, I grew up in southern New Hampshire when things were really starting to boom, and I saw a lot of changes. Um, um, we had this little, um, basically like a tar paper shack that we spent our summers on a on a lake, and we it had been the only, um, the only dwelling on the lake. And then you know that when I was like six, five or six, you look out and it was all dark at night and everything. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was twelve. The entire lake was run was a ring of um, development houses. You know, they probably put in like 150 houses in the course of like six years. Just seeing all all of this stuff happen before my eyes, um, and I got interested in energy and the the fact that we we're using so much. And my first concern was that we're going to run out of of fossil fuel, and I was thinking that very early um, and uh, and we will run out I mean that's another issue about fossil fuel but now we know that before we run out we will have done terrible damage to the climate anyway so it is so that's the climate is more important than running out but um, but civil even if there was no no climate effect at some point in a few generations, we'll run out of fossil fuel. And that would, with a huge number of people depending on fossil fuel to live, to, to for their food, for uh, everything, just for survival, um, th that's a very grim thought as well. So mm -hmm. at any rate, so I've always done things related to energy. I started a bicycle shop when I was very, very young and a bicycle is um, an extremely efficient way to get around, and that was my mm -hmm. big push. You know, I was pushing bicycles to be healthy and clean and environmental. Um, and um, I started this bike shop when I was about ten years old. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, like a lemonade stand, and then I, <laughs> and then I just I I installed solar hot water systems, um, and I I spent a couple of years in Kenya designing water systems that didn't use fossil fuel, which was mm. how people use diesel pumps, which um, they couldn't afford the diesel and they couldn't afford the upkeep. So we were trying to come up with other ways to do it. Find water higher than you are because water <laughs> runs downhill <laughs> is the, <laughs> the <laughs> very best plan. Mm -hmm. um, and then I uh, got into um, commercial, <coughs> um, big building energy use, and that's what I've done for many, many years. Um, and so I, I look at energy in a very analytical way. I love a lot of things that energy has done for us. Um, we have all, all the, the, this stuff in our daily lives that's made possible by uh, plentiful energy. Um, uh, life is so much simpler, so much more, I won't say simpler, yeah. but more, uh, you know, we have incredible freedom to just go where we want, do what we want, but we take that energy for granted and it's going to be very, very hard to give that up or find other ways of doing things. And then uh, that's especially true in rural areas, ironically. Mm -hmm. I think people in rural areas tend to have a holier than thou thing about the cities. You know, the cities are all these people and smog and noise and and you think of them as being big, wasteful, modern things. And here we are, you know, with the farmers market and everything. But um if someone's driving eleven miles each way to the farmers market, you know, my sons in Brooklyn they don't own cars, they bike everywhere, they take public transport, they live in little apartments with a lot of other people that use very little energy uh, compared to these big single-family McMansions that have sprouted <laughs> all over uh, 
southern Vermont and so many other places. So they actually have a much lower carbon footprint living in Brooklyn than the average, you know, Shaftesbury resident who has you know, a three-acre plot and a big house and drives everywhere. Even if they do a lot of good things, they're just in a bad, they've got a bad model there that really needs to, needs a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I do what I can, but I, I'm seeing an awful lot of work ahead of us. I think it's a very um, grim, uh, it's, a, it's quite a task. And this book that inspired your talk, your, this, this show, I guess, is um, it's a good um, summary of that. But you know, mm -hmm. I don't know how, much, how many problems we'll solve today. <laughs> <laughs> so Ethan, what, what kind of approach presently do you think might be effective to try to <coughs> address the problem. <laughs> the, the problem broadly of the climate crisis or more specific, Lee in Vermont? Well, broadly, I guess, yeah. Really, I think that at this point, um, this is a time for creativity, finding creative solutions um, toward, mm -hmm. um, toward a lot of alternative energies. Um, even mm -hmm. within the renewable energy sector, um, it is say better than fossil fuels. We have a fossil fuel addiction in this country which is spread around the world, um, mm. which is gonna be, it's gonna be very hard to withdraw from. Um, but even with, with renewables, there's still environmental impact. Some, some things that I think we're losing right now, which it's, it's gonna be very, very hard um, to solve anything without these two things, um, in my opinion, mm. is specific language um, is the first one. And with mm. specific language, um, something that I hear people saying a lot is um, the climate crisis, or rather, like, this is good for the environment. Say, like, windmills are good for the environment. Solar panels are good for the environment. No, they're not. Um, <laughs> nothing that comes to mind that humans do um, on the environment or exploit from the environment is actively good for the environment. So when we're talking about this kind of stuff, we really need to make sure that we're being tight on our language and saying windmills, solar power, hydropower is, we think, better, than, better for the environment um, than fossil fuels. And it is a renewable source of energy, um, which will last for generations and generations. We do need this infrastructure, and we are very overdue for it. Um, mm -hmm. However, we also not to be so, we shouldn't be so naive as to think that this is a savior and this is going to assuage all problems in our future because it's not going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that I think we really need to be careful of um, is actually truth um, and like making sure that we're looking at fact and respecting that instead of mm -hmm. um, succumbing to our own feelings and thinking that that's more important than just um, rationality or or things that climate scientists are telling us, things that if you observe, if you go out in the woods, um, even in Vermont, you can see so many pieces of plastic, um, which does not degrade. Um, plastic actually degrades with uh, light, um, so it photodegrades and um, into these things called microplastics, which either goes into the soil, goes into a river, which then flows into the ocean, that gets eaten by fish, other marine animals, some uh, a lot of phytoplankton, um, and inevitably comes back to us. It inevitably comes back in humans. It's in the air we breathe. It's in our water. If you have a plastic water bottle, you're drinking far more microplastics than you would be without tap, um, which in turn is then creating more microplastics. So you see, it's very ironic and almost humorous, right? Um, but but where I'm going with this is um, there's there's denial. And there's denial among young people and extreme anxiety about what is going to happen in our lifetimes, what's going to happen in my lifetime, my brother who's 10, my sister who's 2. I'm sure that they are going to have even more struggles and see more disarray within, within the environment than even I will, which is likely going to be saying something. Um, but we do have this denial, and we have this resistance to actually saying, yes, climate change is real, because there's more and more people acknowledge that it's real but also like climate change is real and we need to do something about it in very creative ways that don't just um, perpetuate another bad cycle 
um, in humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really think that it's, it's the language. Um, we need to use specific language. We need to revere fact and over our feelings. Um, and we need to not deny um, the things that are happening. Um, we need to confront it and we need to, it's gonna be dark and it's gonna be grim, but it's gonna be more dark and more grim the further we postpone this confrontation, which is inevitable. So we need to go through that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that must resonate with a lot of your thoughts too, Laura. Uh, right, right. Um, and I sort of think that, um, and, I, and I'm thinking this more and more, um, that we certainly have to be imaginative and innovative to address mm -hmm. um, the issue of, of emissions into the into the atmosphere that <clears throat> are changing the climate. But I think we also have to not depend on renewable sources of energy to sustain the way we live now. Uh -huh. um, that I think we have to really consider and reconsider our lifestyles and um, and like um, Bill said, fossil fuels have given us so much. We live a luxurious life mm -hmm. um, for the most part, even mainly the poorest of us. And we have all these things, uh, we have all these pleasures, we travel, we do what we want um, for the most part. And, and we, ha we really do have to reconsider um, the houses that we live in and um, the, the travels that we make, the way we, we um, uh, uh, accumulate stuff um, mm -hmm. that, um, that we don't need. Um, I'm, I'm thinking Christmas and birthdays because <laughs> yeah. those are coming up in my family and it's like, what can I buy my daughter that that is useful to her and beautiful and that she needs? I don't know. She's got everything that she wants, and if she wants something, she goes and buys it. And so what I'm what I'm giving her is just stuff, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think we really have to reconsider th the way we live our life, mm -hmm. and. Um, and that is complicated by how many people are on the planet because the planet has a finite set of natural resources and um, that, that can't be sort of automatically replicated mm -hmm. and we have more and more people to use those resources. And I think this year it was the end of July, July 29th, something like that that we had used all of the available resources that the, that the earth could supply. So what we mm -hmm. need is one and a half, we need two earths. <laughs> we need the resources of two earths to supply everybody on this earth with the lifestyle that you and I have. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do the math, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work. And um, even if we go to renewable sources of, of energy generation, that is giving us electricity, mm. there's a lot more to consider. And I mm. think McKibben addresses that with his uh, focus on robotics mm -hmm. and on uh, genetic research. And yeah. Yeah. Um, I found those interesting and kind of ironic that those could be viewed as salvaging humanity. Um, yeah. Yeah, that <coughs> didn't seem to go in the right direction for me either. Yeah, no. <laughs> so what what would you reflect on this? In sort of nuts and bolts, what needs to be done? Uh, yeah. Uh, what needs yeah. to be done, Bill? <coughs> what needs to be done? Yeah, well, I, 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 I'm always thinking in very analytical engineering uh, terms, you know, adding things up. 
Um, but I think really um, trying to replicate what we have with renewable energy isn't, isn't really feasible with the number of people in the world and everyone's um, needs and wants. I think we need a kind of a, a more of a fundamental shift um, to a lifestyle that's healthier for one thing um, and, and lower impact uh, where we um, don't travel as much, um, uh, just more modest living and an economic system which um, isn't dependent on exponential growth because uh, mm -hmm. we've, um, we've experienced exponential growth since um, we started um, cultivating, uh, uh, to be doing agriculture probably 5,000 years ago. Before that, we just, everything was um, just, you know, living with nature and we weren't, we, we weren't, our population wasn't increasing. Um, it was kind of borderline whether we'd make it or not. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we uh, made this breakthrough where we could, um, with, ag with agriculture, we could um, grow and really prosper. And um, we've grown exponentially ever since. And um, the funny thing about exponential growth, it's totally different from linear growth because linear growth you can kind of keep doing it forever. You can think of various ways to keep doing more and more, but exponential growth, which is doubling every X years, depending on how fast the growth is. Um, an example that I love to, to use is if you take a barrel full of um, sh sugar syrup and you put one bacterium in it and the bacterium doubles every hour, um, and then you come back and find you come back in uh, 11 days and it's com it's a hundred percent bacteria it's full to the brim when was it half full it was half full an hour ago not mm -hmm. halfway through the, the um, mm -hmm. you know it wasn't it wasn't mm -hmm. six days ago it was so it's doubling is just a it's a crazy notion you can double a certain number of times but you can't just keep doubling so any, and our, ex, expo, our economic system is based on exponential growth. That's return on investment growth. They're not talking about linear growth. They're talking about, you know, we'd love to grow 3% a year. That's what everybody, you know, if the U.S. could do 3% a year economic growth, which means more of everything somehow, <laughs> whatever that means, more pizza, more cars, more whatever. Um, but doubling every three years, I mean, a three year, um, three, three percent growth means that the pot, that the economic system doubles about every, um, be, uh, be like every 21 year, years or something like that. Mm -hmm. So in 21 years, will we have like twice as big houses or twice as many cars and then in another it's not it's then it we're four times you know in another 21 years so when oh. Ethan goes to retire when he's 95 <laughs> years old um, where is he going to is he going to be in a world where where we have like a hundred times more stuff than we do now I mean that's kind of where you'd be after doubling you know five six times you're at it's just crazy, mm -hmm. and so we've doubled so many times over, over our six thousand years. But we are we going to keep doing that? We're, we're really getting to that. It's like that hour, the one hour before that barrel was full. You know, we're just uh, it's just starting to explode. It just mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. <coughs> so, um, so getting back to nuts and bolts, first we have to get our population. Um, under control, and that's a, you know that's a very tough uh, political statement. The population numbers. Po mm -hmm. Population, not uh, um, just somehow the world's population should be grad gradually decreasing, um, which totally blows the idea of exponential growth because that's right. going to make it really hard to do that. But um, 
rapid decrease could be very, very difficult um, for, for a lot of reasons, but a slow decrease in population would be great, and that's not happening soon enough. It is going in the right direction, but it isn't looking good because it's just going to take so long. Uh, uh, so population, um, and then you get into, like I start thinking of engineering fixes, you know, more <laughs> solar panels uh, and more efficiency and all this sort of stuff. But, uh, but really some more fundamental things about lifestyle really need, really need to happen. Mm -hmm. like, and especially the, that idea about, ec about um, exponential growth. We just, we have to say, well, I think we just have enough right now and we don't really need more, you know, we don't need to be, um, to have twice as much in 21 years or something. It's just, why do we need twice as much in another 21 years? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's that's a still not at all nuts and bolts. So if you're getting into like, what should I do today? Yeah, uh, that's another uh -huh. question. Well, and Bill, that's just downright unpatriotic of you <laughs> to <laughs> right. And that's that's another thing that McKibben addresses in the book is is how um, all of this is driven by ideology. And in particular, the ideology that of individualism, that um, we're not in in it as a community or as um, uh, citizens, we're in it as consumers. Mm -hmm. And as consumers, <coughs> we're just worried about our our individual wealth, our individual well-being, and that of our family. Mm -hmm. But that's sort of the limit of what the ideology calls on us to care about. And so if, and, and then that works right on in with this growth mechanism that um, you can have all you want because your want is more important than, than the overall well-being. And <clears throat> He quotes um, Margaret Thatcher as saying, I love this quote. She said, there's no such thing as society. There's only individual people. <laughs> so if there's no society, why do we need to plan? Why do we need to care about each other? Why do we need to come together to make um, uh, a, a community? Why do, we, it, right? It, and so we can, feel good about ourselves because we have more stuff. <clears throat> we keep consuming, and consuming then builds the economy. And if we consume more, then the economy can grow, right? So what McKibben is saying is that all of that is based on this ideology of um, what he calls neoliberalism, um, mm -hmm. which is, um, kind of an old idea, but was really given a lot of strength by Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. So all of this is Ronald Reagan's fault. <laughs> That's what I think. We are living in um, the Reagan alignment still. Right. Until that, we, we shift out of that. We, we really, w as individuals, which create the collective, will have a very difficult time um, finding actual solutions um, to the end of this, this era, this Reagan alignment era. Something that I've been thinking about a lot, especially recently, is this contradiction um, in America, not just America, but like even in myself and in, in, in my community, is this hyper individualism um, that is also leading to more isolation. But like this idea that I am an individual and I have these choices. I want a car. I want, you know, like you said, pizza. I want, like, I want, I want maybe McDonald's. Things that I know that like are not necessarily good for me, but I crave. I'm craving them, right? Um, and I'm choosing. I have X number of money. It doesn't matter whether you're you're rich or whether you are low income. Um, you have money, and money is a representation of what you value. So whether or not you have ten dollars um, from an hour of work, or you have less than that, or you have thirty dollars per hour of work you can spend $10 buying some kind of organic meat and then some low carb vegetables which have higher nutritional value. Maybe that's your lunch and then you don't even have to eat dinner because you're so full with nutrients. 
um, and that saves you money. So you're spending $10 a day, um, or even less, um, but let's just say $10, um, and that's all you eat, right? Or you can spend those $10 on a bunch of carbs, um, like goldfish, pot, <laughs> you know, like pastas, tortillas, all the stuff that's wrapped in plastic. Um, that's not a necessity for your body that you don't need and that isn't going to make you feel good. It's not gonna make you feel about, good about yourself. It's not gonna give you great energy. Um, but then again, if that's what you value over health, you're choosing to spend your money like that. So I think that it's interesting that we disempower ourselves as an individual really across the board, at least every, everywhere that I've been in America um, mm. and even beyond, is, is that we believe in our free will as individuals and we believe that we are individuals, yet we are so disempowered, we have a lack of opportunity of choices and we can't do anything because these politicians, oh no, um, they're controlling everything and they have the power. So what am I to do, right? I'm gonna be apathetic, I'm gonna be on my phone, I'm gonna watch TV, right? Um, until we realize that, that we also have control over our lives, um, which is, is not only, it's true, and it's also empowering too, once we realize that, um, then we can start to modify our lifestyle and then extend that through our contact with each other to actually make some of the bigger changes that we need to make. But I really do think that, that you have to be working on your own lifestyle and realizing that yeah you do have free will and you are an individual and you are not just a consumer and not just mm -hmm. enslaved by the system which is designed literally to enslave you as a consumer and put you in that place where mm -hmm. um, you are just a collective and not an individual so it's a big contradiction um, and most people at, at the top um, would find great disdain, I think, with, um, with what I'm saying, but still, there, with it's such a paradox as as you can see, and that's really mm -hmm. disturbing. And, and um, I think if America can, American people, really, it's going to come down to individual American people, um, can really push through, like I said, and confront this denial um, with the climate crisis, and not just the climate crisis, but other things that maybe we're denying in our life, and realize that we do have individual choice um, constantly, um, then we can, I think, really start to, to build the future that we want for ourselves, mm -hmm. not the future that other people make us think we want. <clears throat> I was thinking when you were talking about going through the zoo with your notebook and relating to all these animals and realizing that they're becoming extinct, <clears throat> uh, how important it's going to be to get people of that age you know, people elementary school, middle school, high school, to start focusing on, you know, the whole idea of the interaction of uh, us and nature and the responsibility we have. Have you ever thought of, you know, what kind of things should be introduced into public education that uh, might help to train people's uh, way of thinking along that line? Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about this recently. I've been thinking a lot about how throughout human history and as, um, over the of the the industrial era as well, even mm -hmm. more specifically, we've been targeting certain species such as mosquitoes or in um, even in America, but um, my mind is going to Africa and Asia, um, mm -hmm. vulture species and vultures live on um, five continents, um, all except Australia and Antarctica. But in Australia, there mm -hmm. is a a similar bird that does the scavenging role of a vulture mm -hmm. um, and what's happening is um, people are poisoning vultures whether this is poachers whether this is um, condors in California um, mm -hmm. because they are scavengers and there's also the stigma about vultures and other scavengers that they are uh, grotesque and ugly and disgusting when in fact their their role is so vital uh, to the ecosystem and so what's happening is their populations are rapidly declining but what people are realizing is they're saying oh shit Vultures are really important. We should be <laughs> killing them, um, but there are still people who are killing them anyway. Like their numbers are not not going up, mm -hmm. um, because <laughs> what happens if you have a dead carcass um, anywhere, um, and a vulture's role is to clean that up? Then who's going to go to that car? They can do that in like thirty minutes to an hour, a whole flock of them, <laughs> and then there's no more carcass. But without the vultures, you can get all these other like 
you know, bear lions and tigers and bears, oh my, <laughs> basically, <laughs> that are that are sitting at this thing for weeks, and that's affecting local communities nearby, um, even more than than a vulture would, or say like mosquitoes. We've we've known about um, the negative impacts of DTT, um, DDT. Um, since 1962 when Rachel Carson came out with Silent Spring. Um, mm -hmm. Why are we still not applying what we learned there um, to pesticides and chemicals that we're putting in the ecosystem and in our bodies now? Um, I feel like she, she gave uh, enough proof that when you target one species, such as a mosquito, um, that inevitably, that those chemicals get absorbed by everything else in the life cycle. Um, and we're still doing that and it's not it's not doing anything right like yeah. every time we try to kill mosquitoes with the next you know line of bug spray um, we're also we're not solving the issue the mosquitoes in turn um, are able to regenerate and are actually right now they're shortening their life cycle um, to evolve and compete um, with the chemicals that we are are putting out and also, like, I think we need to be humble about the fact as humans, like, we don't control everything, and there are a lot of things that we just will not win, and that's okay. Um, so, really, to answer your question, actually, um, mm -hmm. is for an educational component, um, I really want to hit home that, like, once you once you target um, one species or really one flaw in a system, you look like everything is a system and is intricately mm -hmm. involved, so it's gonna affect something. Like if I hurt you somewhere in your body, that will affect another part of your body. Or if there's some, mm. some cancer in your body, other, other parts of your body are responding to that. Everything is holistic. Um, which sometimes people, people look at that, that word and they're like, that's very crunchy, that's, you know, <laughs> like, I don't really like that because of um, maybe some ideas about the people who use that, um, that word. Um, but yeah, I think I think really, really looking at the target, um, targeting species, and, and looking at everything as a system, putting that in an educational tool, something that's more compelling than just photographs um, or or merely words. Um, I'm really thinking about listening and how um, we when we go out into the wilderness. Well, when we go out into nature, there is really no wilderness. You know? <laughs> Um, everything is managed, but when we go into that managed land that feels a little bit more natural than um, our parking lots, um, we are, I think, we go there to listen. We, I think our experience would be very different if we couldn't hear, um, and our love mm -hmm. for the environment would be very different if we could not hear and we could only see. Um, and so I'm, I'm really thinking about what's a way to, to show the vitality of sound um, and biodiversity in an ecosystem, um, mm -hmm. which is constantly degrading, um, and use that as an educational tool. And so it's it's very broad at the moment, but I have the 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 kind of tenets to 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 then sit down and really analyze. All right, like how can I how can I make this um, actually fruitful and actually impactful for people? Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, your sensitivity. <clears throat> so how? Did you teach your boys to be uh, environmentally <coughs> no, sensitive? Um, yeah, very, very definitely. Um, they are, I think they're more environmental than I am um, hmm. for all the talk. Um, yeah, they, um, I wouldn't, I don't know, I, I hate to think that I, the idea that I taught them to do that. I like the, the, the idea that they just learned it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I homeschooled my kids, so I take extra responsibility for I don't want to be thought of as brainwashing them to be <laughs> climate, <laughs> you know, climate advocates or anything, but um, they uh, both um, feel very strongly about sustainability and the climate and their their role in the world. One of my sons in particular is very sort of militant, more probably more militant mm -hmm. than I am about things. Uh, very anti-car. Mm -hmm. Like you really like the car is the enemy, um, mm. which that's one approach. Um, and we do have, I think, just physically a tremendous um, task ahead of us. You know, if you look at cars, 
Um, I just went to a thing about cars last night. Um, <coughs> plan for the, the Northeast, about 11 states have this plan for dealing with our dependence on, on um, oil for transportation. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, um, uh, it's related to a, a carbon tax, but it's more complicated. But I, I, I personally am a huge fan of the car, of a carbon tax. Any, anybody that knows me knows I'm kind of a broken record about <coughs> that. But uh, we talk about how we have to change and you know, we, we should drive less, we should get smaller cars, you know, maybe my next car will do this. Um, you know, uh, next week I'll <coughs> bicycle to town or whatever, but it's always in the future. And if, uh, if gas costs more, that would be a, like today reason, like a real push. Uh, I thought, you know, talking about, talking about um, uh, the nuts and bolts, um, to, for me to drive down here this morning, um, I, I drove an electric car, so I didn't use any oil. But mm -hmm. if, I, if I had driven my Corolla um, that gets about 38 miles per gallon, um, it just wouldn't have cost very much to drive down here, six miles down and six miles back. Mm -hmm. It's just not a very much, like the, the, the dollar amount is um, you know, less than a cup of coffee. It's just not a big deal. Um, and people complain that <coughs> gas is expensive and we should keep it cheap so that to make life easier. But if gas costs as much as the damage that it does, um, you could argue that a gallon of gas should cost like $25 because that's the fee for the permanent destruction of the climate that can't be undone when you burn a gallon of gas. Mm -hmm. I mean, trying to put a price on that is very hard because you're looking at the effect, permanent <coughs> effect, mm -hmm. and most, most effects aren't permanent. Like if no one can live for the rest of eternity, like how do you put a price on that? So at any rate, if, if, ga if gas costs say $25 a gallon, we would live really, it, it wouldn't be like, well, maybe tomorrow I'll bike. It would be I'll bike today <laughs> or I'll call up my neighbors and see when they're going down, we'll drive down together or, mm -hmm. or I'll just move from Shaftesbury down to downtown Bennington. We, like you, you just couldn't keep burning it. And I think that's mm -hmm. where we are right now is that in five years, we can't be using gas the way we are right now or it's mm -hmm. where we've lost mm -hmm. it. And five years, it's not very long. Um, and so uh, I'm really ready for something more, more mm -hmm. than, um, I think education mm -hmm. is great, but it takes a while. <laughs> like I think we need something yeah. right now. So should we put a little sign on our dashboards Every time you get in your car, you read this, I'm doing something very bad. <laughs> well, the, the, the trouble is that, um, you know, you say, yeah, I am, but everybody else is, and next week I won't. You know, it's just like pushing it along. Uh -huh. But if it was like, I, to get in this car and drive to town, it's like, oh, this is going to be really expensive. I better, I've got to find some other way to do it. I think that's cost. Um, you know, one great thing about money is it's a great value system i it it uh, that's all another <laughs> all another um yeah. hour special but um like i um you know you spend money for what seems like your values you know i think oftentimes we're wrong mm -hmm. about it they're like oh that that looks that's shiny i think i want that and then you find out you didn't but mm -hmm. it's a really great um measure of no, we spend money on how how we want to spend it, or at least how we think we want to. Mm -hmm. And if um, if something is really cheap, we use more of it. If it's really expensive, we use less. It, I mean, it's a real, very real drive. And if we, um, I, I know if it was just more expensive to use gas, you know, you'd get an electric car, you'd bike, you'd move closer to work, you'd, you'd do other things. But if Gas costs two fifty a gallon, and we just want to talk about how, how next year we maybe we'll use less, or next week, or whenever. <laughs> it, we're not ever going to stop using it the way we are. Two fifty a gallon isn't enough to push us to stop using it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm procrastinating. Yeah, pro I'm I'm great for procrastinating. I <laughs> I'm going to write a book on it someday. <laughs> and the people that would put the sign, "I'm doing something bad," on mm -hmm. their dashboard. 
already know they're doing mm -hmm. something bad and mm -hmm. don't need the reminder. Uh -huh. And the people that need the reminder wouldn't put the sign on. Mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. <coughs> so you were interested in talking about next Friday, mm -hmm. the, uh, the strike? climate strike. Climate strike, mm -hmm. strike yes. Yeah. Um, so logistically, <coughs> there will be um, some performances um, beginning at 1 in Depot slash People's Park. Um, mm -hmm. And then from there, college students and will be joining town members and then moving to Four Corners um, mm -hmm. to then protest. Um, and uh, at, at Four Corners at 2 p.m. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the kind of logistical the logistical frame. Earlier, um, college students will be will be mobilizing and um, biking and coming down um, to meet the community. And so mm -hmm. I also see this as a really good opportunity um, for the community, for the college community and the town community to um, really come together. Actually, mm -hmm. um, I mean, if if not for our our planet um, and mm -hmm. for each other and for also like not as abstractly as our planet, but like the Vermont ecosystem, um, then, then when, like when, then, then when else would we come together, I think. Um, and this is to, this is, Climate Strike Bennington is a, is a response um, to international global climate strikes which are happening on mm -hmm. September 20th. Um, hmm. So originally this did come out of this organization that Greta Thunberg um, created called Fridays for Future um, where she, among others, um, middle school, high school students, um, and even elementary school, school students, um, would strike on Fridays and not go to school. Mm -hmm. And basically their message was, why am I going to school learning for a future that I'm not going to really have, that you're not promising me um, because of um, inaction? And so this is something that um, has really resonated um, around the world, perhaps another a shot heard around the world, but uh, <laughs> not not in such a, a garish, um, warlike response. <laughs> um, yeah. um, and so that that stemmed into these these two other movements, which one was formed in the UK, one was formed in, in the United States. The the US movement is called the Sunrise Movement, um, which is youth led and is rapidly growing, um, and is propo their proponents of the Green New Deal and creating millions of good jobs in the future. Um, or in the process, rather. Um, and the UK movement is called Extinction Rebellion, which is specifically um, addressing biodiversity loss. And it's, um, their demand is reducing carbon emissions to net zero by 2025 um, to actually halt the worst of, of climate change. Because we, we are really at a pivotal, a pivotal time um, mm -hmm. in terms of this, these, these next few months going into 2020 and then the next decade. Um, and that's not to say, I really hate it when people say, we're too late. Like some people say that now, whatever. Um, that's a <laughs> poor excuse. I'm sure that people will even say that 10 years, even if mm -hmm. we don't, um, even if we don't really like grapple with the problems that we need to be, worst case scenario, I'm sure that people will always be saying it's too late to do that, but that will never make it true. Um, it's never too late to do the right thing. Um, and so... September 20th is a is honestly I think a really good opportunity for high school students middle school students elementary school students especially and parents um, walking with your with your students and coming um, to the strike with your students um, because they are the people who are going to, or with your with your children um, but in a sense they also are your students um, and you should be teaching them um, that they're our <coughs> natural environment is more important than profit, and our people are more important than profit, and for what? Um, mm -hmm. Things that, like we've said on this panel, aren't even good for us, things that we typically think we want, and things that just give people at the top more power. Um, and also, like, this this strike is not just a, like, we're, um, we're upset, or we're, um, we just want to strike just for the sake of it, um, mm. I think it's been, I think that we haven't had a lot of, we haven't had a lot of strikes, at least in, in, in my lifetime and in mm. the past, I mean, really like since World War II, um, there haven't been 
like I don't think this country really knows what it's like to actually go on strike um, in in mass, you know, mm -hmm. and like this mass uncooperation. Um, but back back then in the early twentieth century, there it was actually like we have proof that that strikes were actually a way to to stall and disrupt business as usual, um, which actually does have an effect on the way that this is, this society um, operates. Mm -hmm. And so this is an actual opportunity um, for people to engage with that and disrupt that system, not for just disrupting, um, but actually to demand that Bennington, um, the supervisory union, the energy committee, the chamber of commerce, um, the select board, and then also the college, um, and also um, adopt more rigorous plans. Um, so what what our demands are, are um, I can let you speak a little bit about that in terms of cab. Um, but in terms of <clears throat> well, the, the thing for this strike is a climate uh, emergency. So we would like for the mm -hmm. select board to declare a climate emergency. Mm -hmm. And then um, the, the question is, well, how do you address a climate emergency? What, what in fact, does that mean? Mm -hmm. And so we'd like for them to um, uh, pledge not to um, permit any new fossil fuel infrastructure. We'd like mm -hmm. for them to empower the Energy Committee. Um, we'd like for them to reduce fossil fuel use in the town of Bennington or in the municipal properties mm -hmm. um, by 20% by 2015, 2020. Mm -hmm. And so we understand that those are pretty big asks, mm -hmm. but it's a big problem. And the ask should be commiserate with how we view the problem. Mm -hmm. So um, Climate Advocates Bennington is going to propose those things to the select board. Mm -hmm. um, the first select board meeting after the strike is on the 23rd, and I don't know that we'll be ready by then, but certainly the first um, select board meeting in October will present those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> what would you say to uh, Mr. Nixon or to some other principal who might want to deter the children from participating in Friday's next Friday's event? Um, I think um, <laughs> you look at your priorities, missing um, a couple of hours of school versus making a statement that we really have an emergency and we want, we were really demanding action. To me, um, it's a, a no-brainer. No so and I hope, and one of the things that we don't, did deliberately was to schedule it for early afternoon rather mm -hmm. than the, rather than morning, mm -hmm. so that um, high high school students would be able to walk to the four corners after they're out of school. Uh -huh. So um, they may choose to walk out and actually mm -hmm. strike, mm -hmm. but we'd like for them to join us in any case. Mm -hmm. So we'll be at four corners from two to maybe. 3.30 or 4, so we'd like for them to join us there. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, well, I guess that spends most of our hour. Thank you, Ethan. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. Thank you, Bill. Oh, thanks for, this has been for doing all of this. Very fruitful discussion, and I hope people can take some new ideas to heart. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are we done? Are well, we